Well, here we are. The Giggle. The last episode with the brilliant 14th Doctor and Donna, and the final episode in this trilogy of 60th anniversary specials. And I'm not gonna lie, this episode is the one I'm the most interested to review. Not because I think it's good, and not because I think it's bad, but because I genuinely don't know what to make out of it, even now, as this is being written three months after the episode came out. As context for all of you watching, I watched all of the specials twice before starting writing the review for them, and second time when my steelbook of the specials arrived. And when I watched the Starbies for the first time, I was pretty pleased with it. I'd seen and picked up on a lot of issues that the story has, but overall I enjoyed it, and even upon my rewatch I enjoyed it, even if significantly less. When I first watched Wild Blue Yonder, I was absolutely blown away. And on my rewatch, I was still really impressed with it. But when I first watched The Giggle, I watched it with two of my best friends, one of which is a lifelong Doctor Who fan like myself, and the other who hadn't seen the show before, but she wanted to watch it with us anyway. And when I first watched The Giggle, I was really happy with it, and I did enjoy it, but I didn't think it was good. You can probably guess as to why. And even when I watched it again, I thought it was good, but also very, very heavily marred. So this review is going to be the most interesting for me to write because I don't even really know whether this episode is good or bad. But one thing I am certain of is that it's still way better than the Star Beast, as that story just gets worse and worse the more you think about it. And Wild Blue Yonder being so linked to this story and setting it up in such a natural way really didn't do it any favours. Also, apologies for how late this video is, but since my birthday, which the Wild Blue Yonder review came out two days after, I basically haven't had a day off. Pretty much every single day for the past two, but probably three months by the time this video's out, I've either been at work, and if I haven't been at work, I've been out for someone else, and I haven't had a single day off to myself. So I've had literally no time to make this video. So little time, in fact, that despite essentially giving myself five months to make three videos because I wanted these reviews out before the new series started, I didn't even manage to achieve that goal, since the first two episodes of series 14, or whatever you want to call it, are already out. And at the time of this being recorded, the series is halfway over. Uh... What? It's blank? Are you kidding me? Not again. I also filmed this video directly after filming this audio, so you might want to watch that if you want to see some early thoughts. But, but, but let's not dilly-daddle and dawdle anymore, because we all deep down know my intros kind of suck, and let's review The Giggle. So similarly to Wild Blue Yonder, this episode opens in the past, in Soho 1925, and right off the bat, I have to praise the presentation of the toy maker throughout this story. Neil Patrick Harris was the most perfect actor to cast for this role, and he plays him amazingly throughout, with tons of charm and charisma, and he just has such a great aura throughout this episode, and is honestly really scene-stealing throughout. Which is especially impressive for anyone to do when sharing screen time with two of the greatest to ever do it. And even his absolutely horrific German accent plays into a part of this character that I do like. And that I was quite surprised the story acknowledged and even more surprised that Russell didn't just brush it off, considering the connotations. For those of you who don't know, the Celestial Toymaker in the original story, and the story as a whole, is low-key kinda racist. For starters, the word celestial can be used as a derogatory way to refer to someone with Chinese descent, and considering the more commonly known definition of the word, that's pretty mad to say the least. And considering this was in the 60s, the word was definitely meant to be used in that derogatory context. It also doesn't make the story look any better that the toy maker was a white man who was dressed like this. And I do really like and think it's quite brave to keep the idea that this character is racist intact for this story, to even further amplify how evil he is and how much disregard he has for humanity to still have such a trait in current year. I thought it was brave for Russell to present the master as sexist in the late 2000s, 
But to have a racist character as a villain in the 2020s? You just gotta respect the balls it takes to do that. At least this time it was intentional. I really must apologize for the rain. You must be used to sunnier climes. Unlike the original story, which is that tone deaf and dated, it features the character of Doctor Who saying the N word. What? What? Yes, that did actually happen, and no, I will not play it. You can find it out with a simple Google search. <laughs> Context tangent aside, I do think that the Toymaker's accent does play a good part in this story, as because it's so goofy and over the top, it makes him all the more intimidating when that mask slips and we hear his real voice when he's being serious or threatening. I cut it off the head of a beautiful lady. She will not miss it, but then she will never miss anything ever again. He's just so good already, man. Immediately setting up an intimidating presence with this horrific implication while still hamming up his accent, showing that he wouldn't even take what he did seriously in the slightest. This is the first time in years I get to say we're off to a great start, and we actually are. So we see the first image of television invented, and with the retroactive perspective that the Toymaker was directly involved with this, and how we saw the last episode end, we all know what we've seen must have been caused by him, especially with his distinct laugh playing us into the title sequence. I don't know how many times I can say we're so incredibly back before it loses all meaning, but hell man, can you blame us? This episode manages to hook you in after the last one so incredibly well in just under five minutes. Speaking of the last one, we pick up where we left off, with the Doctor and Donna in present day Earth saying chaos ensue, with what the world would look like if everyone thought they were right and wouldn't change their mind. As someone who has worked in retail for the past three years, serving the general public, I can safely say that I found this setting incredible, and honestly, seriously, scarily accurate. No, don't tell me what I can and can't do at my job. I'm the one who actually works here and know what I'm doing. No, you can't have an exception to a rule because someone did it before. I'm not them. While the guy willing to let himself get hit by a car might seem a bit over the top, I have honestly had people use rationale this stupid against me before. So honestly, this isn't even out of the question to happen. So Unit arrived to pick up the Doctor and Donna to bring them to the beautiful Unit headquarters, and after some painfully upset and reused lines from Wilf, You go with the Doctor! Don't listen to her! You go with the Doctor! You go with the Doctor! Surely the GOAT returns, and once again we get the return of... Kate Lethbridge Stewart! Now, I'm not gonna lie, Complete transparency here, I do not remember for the life of me if Kate was any good in the Chibnall era. As far as I remember, he used her fine, but she didn't really do much. But I can gladly say that she was used in this episode pretty well. She's always been a great supporting character, and it's good to see that she's still being used well in series 14. And she points out what makes this episode's concept so far so inherently interesting, as this is essentially all of humanity lashing out and you can't really combat that. And I think this scene does explore the possibilities well. As, of course if everyone is being violent and lashing out, they aren't going to listen to Unit, especially if they're trying to stop everyone from feeling the way they do, with that feeling being entitlement. It can't really be combated. Do you have any idea how many entitled people I've met in my life? You can't reason with them. <laughs> Even on a smaller scale, have you ever tried to convince people that they're wrong on something before? Because I have, in a professional and personal way, and at least in the professional way I've done it. You should see the amount of whining and crying you receive even for just pointing it out. Not even directly to a person, just pointing it out. <laughs> Also, this is something I've been meaning to bring up since the Starbeast review, but I honestly don't know how I feel about Unit being so out in the open and known to the world. 
I feel like it honestly loses a lot of its charm when it is essentially the Hooniverse equivalent of the Avengers Tower. Because the point of unit was supposed to be this secret organization set up to stop alien threats with occasional assists from the Doctor. Now, obviously this point was lost a long, long time ago, since New Who does so many world ending threats that can't really be covered up in a natural way. But at least in the Moffat era, I cannot believe I'm about to use the Moffat era as a good example. But at least in the Moffat era, the headquarters was still a secret and not just smack bang in the middle of the city. Now obviously times change and Unit couldn't stay a secret forever, but don't you think that it being in the middle of the city, in this huge tower that people would just start to question it more and more? Like, where do they get all the money from? How do they deal with these alien threats so well? Maybe they have a person who often helps them deal with alien threats. And maybe that person himself is an alien, since they seemingly all go by the same alias yet always look different. My point being that while I don't inherently have an issue with Unit not being a secret anymore, I really think that it could lead to the eventual implication that everyone, at least in the UK, knows who the Doctor is, which would really go against the purpose of this character. It's like how in the Moffat era, well, I, I was gonna say essentially implied, but it basically outright told us that every single Earth leader, Prime Ministers, Presidents, knew who the Doctor was. That's more like an example of Moffat era writing. Also, as we go into Unit, we're reintroduced to Mel Bush. <laughs> the Seventh Doctor's companion, who, unfortunately for Bonnie Langford and us watching, was written absolutely awfully in the 80s. But thankfully, from her few scenes in this episode, she gets to show us a much more enjoyable side of the character. And I'm glad that similarly to what he did with Sarah Jane, Russell has removed all of the poor elements of her character and has completely reformed her into a much, much better character. Now obviously Mel's upgrade isn't as good as Sarah Jane's, but similarly to Kate, her presence in this episode is felt and she's a good addition, and she complements every scene she's in quite well. And this most likely isn't the last time we've seen her, so I'm glad she was reintroduced in such a natural and fitting way. Okay, while editing this, I was reminded, but I completely forgot that Mel made a cameo in Power of the Doctor. So this isn't really much of a reintroduction, as much as it is a repurpose, but we move. What do I care? I mean, seriously. Why should I care about you? No change there, then. BASED! So we get an example from Kate of what the effects of the self-indulgence are. Bit strange that the head of unit is the one doing this, and no one tries to stop her, but I actually do really like this scene, as it highlights the deepest, darkest aspects of her character that have been hidden away for a long time, and I think that subconsciously Kate not trusting the Doctor is a really interesting bit of extra depth that her character has needed for quite a while. Because of course she should have deep-seated doubts about the Doctor, as helpful and amazing as he is and can be, at the end of the day, he does just disappear, usually without warning or hesitation, and undoubtedly she would have heard this from her dad from a very early age, who had to deal with it way longer than she did. And especially since the Doctor's personality can change significantly when he regenerates, and not long before this, the last time we seen Kate the Doctor was a woman, how could you not have deep seeds of doubt, even if they are at the very, very back of your mind? Even the roasting of the gingers and Shirley was very well done. Well, I say it's well done for Shirley, that being in the back of Kate's mind is actually kind of mad. <laughs> Unfortunately, it was at this exact moment during my rewatch for this review, it dawned on me what was really going on. So, obviously, we could sort of already clock on this was the Toymaker's doing, because it was completely obvious and we were outright showing. But when it's fully revealed that he implanted this sort of hypnosis on every single person on planet Earth by using the first image of television that is on every screen, and it manipulated people into acting like this, that... Hmm. All of this is starting to sound very familiar. Awfully familiar, in fact. Awfully familiar to the point where if you really think about it, this is just an extension on the already existing story beats from the Series 3 finale. A crazy person played by an amazing actor who steals every scene he's in, looking for power and control doing so in a way which mostly entertains themselves, yet the Doctor is emotionally impacted by it on a personal level. 
This is literally just the sound of drums. Imagine my shock having spent so much time complaining about Chibnall and Moffat just trying their best to rip off Russell T Davies in series 12 and 13 and so many of Moffat's series and episodes, only for Russell to come back and rip off his own work. We've checked and double checked, it's not like the old Archangel Network. Really? Wow. And to make this even worse, we get this absolutely brilliant scene of the Doctor shunning the Union soldiers along with essentially the whole human race, which I think not only perfectly highlights the Doctor's views on humanity when they use their brilliance incorrectly. Don't go thinking you've got an excuse. The human race might be clever and bright and brilliant. It's also savage and venal. All the anger out there on the street, the lies, the righteousness, that's human, that's you, that's who you are, using your intelligence to be stupid. But it's also very in line with the Tenth Doctor's character. But after this, it's established that destroying the satellite would break the connection, yet would have international consequences as Kate says, which is why they haven't done it yet. Yet even after the satellite is destroyed, we are never shown this happen in the rest of the episode. And after a funny scene with Donna and Kate, this entire plot point is completely dropped and never brought up again. Ha! Huh? I don't understand. Okay, I'm sorry, but what in the actual name of all that's holy and sane with this world was even the point of this plot point being in the episode? We spend practically the first 20 minutes of this story on this, yet Overall, it was pretty much just a waste of time that had practically no consequences. And is in a very similar vein to the Star Beast. And in case we weren't clear on that yet, that is not a good thing. In which, we are showing what devastations this causes, but it doesn't really feel like it has any impact to the story or universe. Like this episode could have showed us how this change directly affected pre-established characters, and it does show us how it affects people on the streets, for literally less than two minutes. While none of this part of the story is inherently bad, even if it is a blatant rip-off of the sound of drums, it's overall kind of just a waste of time that doesn't even really play that much of a key part into the narrative, and is ultimately just a bit pointless. Like, if you really wanted to include this part in the story, it so obviously needed so much more time to develop and actually needed to be resolved in a satisfying way, instead of half-baking this really interesting idea of the Toymaker bringing out all of humanity's worst aspects to fight against themselves and then not really do anything with it. And considering the first 20 minutes of this episode is pretty much pointless, it then begs the question as to why it was included over scenes and explanations that this episode desperately needed, yet didn't have. Gah, yeah, because establishing a plot point, then not using it, was clearly so much better of a use of everyone's time than actually making the law-bending rules this episode introduces actually make sense. <sighs> also, I just thought, if K is offering up- oh fuck, my voice is gone. No, wait, hold up. Wait a minute. So much later that the old narrator got tired of waiting, and they had to hire a new one. After a sudden nosebleed, I've been resurrected. Also, I just thought, if K is offering up a position to Donna, then why isn't Donna bringing up the coverage of the price they would give her for a house? And unit have a great insurance policy. Damaged property in the course of an alien war. Bear in mind, that this happened only a couple of hours ago for Donna, so why this still isn't on the top of her head remains a mystery to me. My house! I don't know if any of you have priced houses recently, but Christ, if I was her, this would not left my mind for a second. Also, I know no one probably remembers this, and I didn't even question it until I did some digging, but genuinely, how did Mel get here? As far as I remember, which very well could be wrong because I didn't rewatch the Classic Who story because I might be somewhat dedicated to making content, but don't be ridiculous. But I swear, Mel when she left the Doctor was in the future. 
the very, very, very far, very, very, very distant future. How the hell did she time travel back to modern day Earth and just so happened to age the exact same way that Bonnie Langford did in real life? While undoubtedly she has aged impeccably well, she then also says this. Good old Sablon Blitz, he lived till he was 101. What? 101! <laughs> Now, while I couldn't find an exact age for Glitz, let's assume he's the same age as the actor Tony Selby, and he's 49 at the time of Dragonfire. Are you seriously trying to tell me that Mel spent 52 years with him and then miraculously got back to Earth, yet looks like this? That is absolute fucking hogs troll up, mate, and you know it. Bonnie Langford would have only been around 57 when this episode was filmed, but if we go by what the show is telling us, Mel would have to be at least 72 or 74 by the time Glitz had died. Because Mel was only around 20 or 22 when she appeared in Doctor Who. I don't know exactly because I'm assuming Big Finish probably like fucked with it or something, so she met him earlier. Oh wait, no, that happens in trial. Ah, I don't know, it doesn't really matter. The point being that this makes no sense. Name five people who are in their 70s, but look and can move around this well. You can't! And back on the topic of how she got back to Earth, how did she exactly? So I got a lift off a Zingo and came back to Earth. What's a Zingo? It's the thing you get a lift off. How? 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 Okay, so this Zingo thing that you can apparently get lifts off not only de-aged Mel by about 15 years, but it can also travel in time. That doesn't make any goddamn sense! Like, if she wasn't in the future, just saying this would have been a fine enough explanation on its own. But it's the fact that she was in the future and... Her ages obviously don't align, that make Mel even being here a bit of a plot hole. Which is a shame, as like I said before, she's way better now than she was in the 80s, but her presence of even being here makes no damn sense. I think I'm starting to pick up on why I've been so unsure about this episode for so long, and so far, it's because shit is just sort of happening without rhyme or reason, and it just sort of falls into place. But that place is built on a mountain of lies and nonsense. So the Doctor and Donna travel back in time to see when Stooky Bill was televised, and we then get the aspect of this episode that I actually do really like. And that's the idea that the Doctor is running himself thin, and just sort of needs to retire. And this is yet another time where I'm going to have to over-compliment David Tennant's performance, because he absolutely kills it in scenes like this. The Doctor's want and need to move on from this discussion and just brush it off as normal and continues what he's doing, something that this character is infamous for doing. In this scene, we see him actually consider what Donna's saying when she says she was inside his mind. And if we think back to the best episode of Doctor Who since the end of time, we'll remember one thing that hurt the Doctor the most in this story was when the not-thing Donna brought up his past and how he keeps running, and we see how hurt he was, not only by hearing all of his trauma brought back to him, but realising that, at least in his mind, he can never truly be consoled by someone, as they'll never truly understand what he's been through, unless they were told. And obviously the Doctor, being the Doctor, would never consider that he needs help and time to heal himself. We've seen from the very beginning of these specials since Donna got her memory back that he's been brushing off saying what he's done in the past. Because 90% of it is just trauma. Harking back to the good old days when it would take the companions an effort to get anything like this out of the Doctor. But with Donna and the Doctor already knowing each other, obviously she already knows how to touch his heart. Which is just... Ah, so good! And you can tell when Donna says that he's been staggering along, that he knows she's right, but he just can't admit it to himself yet, and it's absolutely superb! I don't know how many times I can say this, but this is yet another detriment to the Star Beast, 
Because while Wild Blue Yonder sets up this plot point brilliantly, the Star Beast does absolutely nothing with this idea, even though it clearly had the opportunity to. And similarly to this episode, you can just cut aspects of that story out to focus on the more important parts. But nah, plot points that go nowhere and scenes discussing pronouns of an alien that he should know anyway are clearly so much more important. And while the setup in Wild Blue Yonder is fantastic, because that is only a one hour episode, which doesn't even really entirely focus on that, it makes this change in the Doctor's character seem a bit sudden. It's a very double-edged situation here, because while yes, this is fantastic, we should have had so much more build-up to this over the specials. The most interesting line in the trailers to me was when the Doctor says, I don't know who I am anymore. But yet, the Star Beast not focusing more on the Doctor's identity crisis, and instead being the mess that it was, has really dampened the effect that this brilliant scene is going for, which is a huge shame. Because as much as I can and probably will most likely be slagging this episode off for god knows how much longer, OH MY GOODNESS! The one thing this episode has going for it consistently is this story beat, which really does have to work overtime because of all the shit it's crammed in between. So the Doctor and Donna meet the Toymaker, and after he makes fun of the Doctor for having no balls, the story completely forgets how to be subtle for a minute. Donna, go back to the TARDIS. Go back to the TARDIS. You never tell me to do that. Wow. Really? I wonder if everyone on planet fucking Earth already knows that! Seriously, it's just little things like this that really dampen the effect of scenes because of how much more effective this would be if we just had Donna giving a shocked and worried expression that the Doctor would even ask her to do this, as opposed to just outright spelling out why this is a surprising thing for him to say. It's stuff like this that really makes me miss the RTD era. Wait. This is the RTD era. Oh dear. Be careful what you wish for, punk. No! Uh-uh! Neil Patrick Harris, however, completely steals the show here once again, and like I was bringing up before, him suddenly speaking in his normal voice very well highlights to me why his goofy accent plays such a key part in this performance. Because while it is completely unserious, it shows us how he just doesn't take anything that's going on seriously, yet whenever he does and he talks normally, he's very intimidating because you can tell he's actually locking in and he's taking it seriously. And for such an over-the-top character, this works masterfully at making them intimidating. This episode really isn't straying far from those Series 3 parallels, is it? After the Toymaker runs away, we get this really interesting sequence in which the Doctor and Donna walk around these never-ending corridors, which, I must admit, is a very well-done scene. It's very well edited and shot and directed brilliantly throughout, really exemplifying the creepy tone this story is going for, and it ups the threat and tension excellently. Especially with the Doctor saying that the TARDIS is an idea that the Toymaker would just throw away, and we're in his domain, where it's governed by the rules of play. The idea alone that the TARDIS, one of the most impressive and dynamic ships in all of fiction, just doesn't even phase the Toymaker, is excellent. Really selling us on how powerful and omnipotent he is. Shame we couldn't have been shown more of this instead of just wasting time for the first 20 minutes of this episode, but whatever. Then the carrying aspect of this episode comes back once more, with this absolutely superb scene of the Doctor essentially being riled up with guilt to the point of depression. You already know this exchange is going to be massively done, when before it even properly starts you see the Doctor dreading to even answer Donna's question, because this is, yet again, the Doctor's past catching up with him. Something brought up before by Donna, but now he has to actively confront it here and it's brilliant. Made all the more better by the revelation that the Toymaker, even being here, is completely the Doctor's fault. Remember when in Wild Blue Yonder he invoked a superstition at the edge of the universe and he was very sort of like, Oh, I shouldn't have done that. Yeah, that wasn't just a cheap trick he pulled out. It had direct consequences and here they are now. This 
excellently plays into the notion that the Doctor is wearing himself out. He only has so many tricks and ideas, but they can't work forever, and this is here to prove that. And you can really tell he's wearing himself out by how snappy and pessimistic he is with Donna, unsure whether he can even save her from this, which is just cinema. I feel like we haven't seen the side of the Doctor in so long, and it is really shining here as this is the sort of depth that was so absent from the 13th Doctor, and made her just so boring and dull to watch. Because of course you'd be overridden with guilt for causing humanity to fall in on itself when you just didn't need to, you were just trying to be clever. And all of that stuff, 11, 12 and 13 caused to happen, must be riding very high on his conscience now, having not only his past in Donna back in the picture, but also Mel and Kate. Which further leads into an exceptional scene with the toy maker later, but we'll get to that soon enough. Maybe I'll save you. You big idiot. The foreshadowing for the Doctor's fate has been so good in these last two stories, man. This is the type of source that this show has really been missing, and not the type of subtlety that Series 14 has been having so far. The one who waits is almost here! Don't worry, the 60th is not exempt from this either. Just wait till I tell the boss. My legions are coming. Did I get it? Back on topic for a second, and I must say that Donna and the Doctor's relationship being pre-established really does help this story a lot, because we already know how well these two do at supporting each other, so scenes like this work all the more effectively given the two's relationship already. This just adds even more onto it, even if it is 15 years later. After a very inevitable split up, we get shown these two fascinating moments set up by the toy maker. And this scene with the Doctor in particular is so well done. The idea that the toy maker's laugh wouldn't leave the man from the beginning's head, driving him crazy enough to the point where he goes back, only to be tricked into a game, and then have his entire body except his head turned into a puppet, that's absolutely wild! Great creativity and horror aspects here. And it gets even better when the toy maker starts mocking the doctor for leading him into reality. I thought I was no wonder the doctor deep down knows he wants to stop. This must be absolutely terrific outright and then get mocked for it as well. Absolutely ruthless. And this continues with Donna when she gets attacked by these eerie Scottish dolls, which are just... Ugh. These scenes work brilliantly at further setting up the toy maker's danger and power he has. That he's able to just torment the characters in such an effective way. Also, the Stooky Babas were actually set up earlier in the episode, which does make this scene in particular great on rewatch. But you believed his family all alone. Poor Stooky Sue and the poor Stooky Babas, you would leave them without Papa. That's what I'm talking about! That's why he's doing it! And I warn you now, if this is a trick, I will kill you. Hello, Stooky. My name's Donna. Now I think that you're a goner. Anything to add? No, she's actually the best, man. I've missed her presence so much in this show. Oh my god. It's just little scenes like this being carried on their own purely by reaction. Oh, they're just priceless. I really do hope that one day we get another companion that's this well written and performed and cast so perfectly. So the two reunite and the excellence continues as the toy maker then decides to mock the Doctor further by taunting him about all of his recent companion departures and misdeeds. And I think the biggest stinger from this is that we've seen the Doctor avoid talking about this in every story so far because of how much it's been haunting him. Why is it one last trip? Because you could visit. We could do outrageous things like have tea. Point is, You've been given a second chance. You can do things different this time. So why don't you do something completely new and have some friends? Yeah. Where have you been since I lost you? I don't know, the usual. Robots chases waterfalls. Ah, okay. But what really happened? A knock. And the toy maker directs all of this at Donna then repeatedly mocks the Doctor for how he tries to justify this stuff in his mind at the time. And the aspect that I do like about this on a meta level is that Russell is low-key taking the piss out of Moffat 
for trying to have his cake and eat it too with how he wrote out all of his companions. Because Moffat was such a heavy proprietor of the writing style of style over substance dog shit, they would always have these massive events that you'd think would affect the character in a deep and meaningful way like we'd seen before, but they were either ignored completely or brushed off after like, one story. Same applies with the Flux. While on the surface level the Tenth Doctor may seem the same in every series, if you really pay attention you notice how every departure and major event in his life plays a key part in how he would act in the series. After losing Rosie becomes much more dark and distant, trying not to form attachments and he treats Martha poorly in the first half of the series because of it. After learning and growing from the mistakes he made with Martha, when Donna came back he reassured that he only needed a friend, and he was way less dark in this series because Donna was such a good balance for him, and could bring him back down. Something she did on the very first day she met him. But after the awful series 4 finale, the Doctor loses everyone and goes off on the deep end. Way more defeatist and prone to making mistakes, and despite trying to mask it, he's obviously miserable and is afraid of losing the one thing he has left, his own life, which he ends up losing not long after anyway. But then we go to Eleven, and when he loses the ponds, he's down and depressed, for one half of the snowmen, not even the full episode, and then he's back to normal, even though his normal at this point was an insufferable caricature. And then when Twelve loses Clara, we get one of the best Twelfth Doctor episodes ever, immediately followed by one of the worst episodes of Doctor Who ever. So that was great. And then when he loses Bill and Nardole, he doesn't have the time to grieve or anything because he's too busy fucking around with the first Doctor. But the key point in all of those examples is despite all of the characters dying, they actually don't. The Doctor just never sees them again because plot. And despite 13 having the worst, most horrible act of genocide essentially caused because of her, she just doesn't even really seem to be upset by it. Which is again, what made this scene in Wild Blue Yonder so damn good. It destroyed half the universe because of me. We stand here now on the edge of creation, a creation which I devastated. So yes, I keep running, of course I do. How am I supposed to look back on that? It wasn't your fault. I know! And the truly brilliant thing about this scene is how it once again morally reprimands the Doctor for trying to justify all of these events, despite them all technically being his fault, which the Errors themselves so rarely did because they were too scared to make the Doctor come off as a bad person. Because the one time they did, people complained about it too much, despite it being the best iteration of the Doctor Moffat ever wrote. I think he's probably her uncle, but I may made that up to pass the time while they were talking. This is Clara, not my assistant. She's uh, some other world. I'm his carer. Yeah, my carer. She cares, so I don't have to. And the cherry on top of all of this is that this whole scene is presented by the Toymaker, hamming it up only to seriously snap back to his real persona to make the Doctor feel even worse about himself, while also creatively showing off all of these events with even more puppets to keep up the creepy tone the last 10 minutes of the story has had. Man, if the whole episode was like this, you wouldn't have had to listen to me complain for 20 minutes of the review already. I also think it's extremely poignant that the Doctor finally snaps to challenge the Toymaker to a game when Donna asks him if any of this is true. Because it shows off an aspect of this character that I do quite like, and that's that he tries to hide his past from his companions, because it's his burden to bear. At least now, finally, these are being acknowledged as his mistakes and he doesn't want anyone else to know that he caused all of this to happen. Especially someone who he cares about. He doesn't even want them to think about his burden because then they'd worry about him, which is something this character has avoided for so long. As easy as it would be, and honestly is easy, to just ignore all of the incarnations of the Doctor that precede David Tennant, I'm really glad that 14 does exist, because it seems like this one, and the one in Wildview Yonder, that finally add weight and consequences to a lot of the stuff from the previous two eras. While you can look at 10 and 14 as just a continuation of David Tennant being Doctor Who, 14's story is also massively benefited from 11, 12 and 13. Which is really surprising because if we don't beat around the bush here, they're all pretty shit Doctors, despite great moments they can have. Finally. 
So good fucking food. So they play a really lame game of pick up the bigger number card. All right. And we get loads of brilliant lines of build-up and world-building from the Toymaker, which I can't lie, I am very conflicted on. On one hand, a lot of these things can and most likely will build up to a lot of cool stuff that's in the future, with a lot of cool implications and ideas. But on the other hand, because we don't have an answer for any of this yet, a lot of this dialogue can leave a lot to be desired, to say the least. I made a jigsaw out of your history. Did you like it? Huh? Um, what the fuck is that supposed to mean? Is this implying that the Timeless Child was the Toymaker's doing? Well, feasibly, yes, he could fuck with someone's origin. That's such an open-ended thing to say that it leaves a lot more questions than answers. Like, how did he do that? Why did he do that? Hasn't he only been back in existence for like two days? How did he have time to do that? Why would he change the entire origins of the Time Lords just to make a group of them a bunch of useless donuts that tortured a random child for its power? And most importantly, WHY DOES THE DOCTOR NOT QUESTION ANY OF THIS?! And it gets even worse! The master was dying and begged for his life with one final game, and when he lost, I sealed him for all eternity inside my gold tooth. You know, I hate to do this because I think this entire era is an affront to not only Doctor Who, but just entertainment and fiction as a whole. But how the fuck did the Master manage to survive this bullshit AGAIN?! When the Master inevitably returns again, considering this is Russell, he might at least attempt to explain it. But here, with there being practically nothing to go off, I just have to reinforce that we have literally just watched the master die three episodes ago! What? Did he just lie there like that for comedic effect? Then somehow be fit enough to accept a game from the Toymaker who knew who he was uh, and where he was? How exactly? I don't know. Plot. I know this is just going to be, Ooh, Richard Reviews glaze in the RTD era again. But I do seriously wish that the master just stayed dead after the end of time, because this character's legacy has been destroyed so much in the last decade, it's insane. We will never get anything as meaningful for the character as this again. Get out of the way. You die with me, Doctor! I know. Get out of the way. You did this to me! Also, we have now seen the Master die three times definitively in New Who, and they're baiting bringing him back again. <laughs> also, the Toymaker teases more for the one who waits. This just doesn't really do much for me because, again, this style of storytelling is so played out in New Who at this point that I don't really care about just the lines on their own. The thought of there being a creature more powerful than the Toymaker is fascinating. I just wish this information was delivered to us in a much more interesting way. That's the game of the 21st century. They shout, and they type, and they cancel. Alright, buddy. I also think it's pretty strange how this scene here reinforces how the one thing the Toymaker can't do is cheat a game to win. Yet, this doesn't play any part into the narrative in defeating the Toymaker, or anything, really. Even though when you look at how this story was actually resolved, it really easily could have, but we'll get to that eventually. So the Doctor loses and challenges the Toymaker to the best of three. They go back to the present. We then get the waste of the first 20 minutes of this story's promise, and the Doctor warns Unit about the Toymaker. And then we get this absolutely amazing scene where the Toymaker does a full dance show to spice up your life by the Spice Girls, and oh my god! This scene is truly phenomenal. Exceptional, even. Not only is this extremely entertaining and funny, but it still reinforces how much of an omnipotent power the Toymaker is when he turns bullets into flowers and some soldiers into just bouncy balls just by touching them. 
Honestly, this is just a brilliant scene, even further amplified by all of the characters' reactions. However, unfortunately, as brilliant as this scene is, I can't help but think this is yet again something that I've seen before in the Series 3 finale. I can't decide whether you should live or die. Like, these characters alone are already extremely similar, but given the Toymaker a dance sequence before a major event in the episode as well, come on, man. What's that supposed to mean? I found this way too funny for absolutely no reason. So after the Toymaker sang Scissor Sisters, he went to the Galvanic Beam, and this scene is brilliant. All of the dialogue exchanged here is excellent, with some really standout lines and delivery, amplifying the threat and tone of the story very well. Your fight is with me! You know full well this is merely a face concealing a vastness that will never cease because your good and your bad are nothing to me. Where are my staff? The beam had a pilot and, and the armorer and the ground staff. Where are they? I think they're still falling. Get back inside! And I said nine! <laughs> All that exists is to win or to lose. The Doctor then does what I full well wanted him to do in the Star Beast because it would have helped this angle, and that's try to reason with the Toymaker but fail due to ultimately showing the Toymaker all of Earth. While this isn't exactly what I'd asked for in the original Star Beast review, you can at least see how the Toymaker would be more likely to accept the Doctor's offer had the Doctor not shown him to Earth. And the Toymaker's monologue here is fucking sublime! Until Russell T Davies, that absolute, sick, twisted, cruel bastard, does it again. He makes me watch as I lose my hero and he becomes someone else. And I've got to point out how well done this is. David Tennant's performance here, not as if you haven't heard me say this a hundred thousand times already, is fucking incredible. Really selling you on the idea of the Doctor's sadness of losing his life this early. But also a distinct difference here is that he's ready to accept it and move on. Something the 10th Doctor was so afraid of doing because he wanted that settled down life but just having it stripped away from him too much led him to just run away. But 14, seemingly in this story, is the opposite. He's more scared of settling down than he is running away. And I think one of the key reasons for this is that the Doctor this time gets to die with his companions by his side, with Donna bravely proclaiming that he won't die alone, because she already knows he's had to suffer through that already. Murray Gold also really shines here with this beautiful score, swelling and shining, and all the tears are being held back until... Okay, so yeah, it's time to finally address the elephant in the room with this episode. That being this scene where the Doctor splits in two, and it's dubbed by generation. Believe it or not, I actually don't have a problem with this. In concept. But the execution of this idea in the story is fucking awful, and there is no denying it. First of all, there is absolutely no explanation of how this actually happened. Sure, the 15th Doctor tells us that it's a myth, and it doesn't exist. That doesn't count in my statement from before. Why does this happen? Don't know. What's gonna happen to the 14th Doctor? I don't know. Will he eventually just die from old age and become the 15th Doctor? I don't know. Even if he does do that, does he just fade away? I don't know. Does he meet with the 15th Doctor and they become one again? I don't know. Is he just going to regenerate when he sees fit? I don't know. If he dies again, does he become the 15th Doctor or does he just cease to exist? I don't know. Is there now just always going to be two Doctors that exist forever? 
I don't know. Does this happen to all Time Lords? Surely not, because we would have seen it before. Or is this just exclusive to the Doctor? I don't know, but there it is. The point being, this is not remotely explained at all, and it kills this story. Don't get me wrong, there is a lot before and after this scene in this story, which is superb. But the fact that this law-bending, undoubtedly enormous event just happens, and there is literally no explanation for it. It is without doubt the most style over substance thing that Davies has ever wrote for this show. And that is extremely disappointing. You literally could have just said that the Toymaker did this. But he seems just as shocked as everyone else is. What? 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 The only benefit of me taking so damn long to upload is that I do now have additional context from series 14. So, what does that add? When we first met, I said, I said the toy maker, and defeating him took everything. It ripped me in half. But you survived. It literally, it tore my soul in half. I can't survive that again. Oh. So this was caused by the toy maker. For some reason, him being shot by the galvanic beam is enough to rip his soul in half. Even though the toy maker did nothing to the gun to make it any different, and also the previous doctor died to a much more deadly laser if we're being for real. So falling off a tower, being shot twice, thrice, thrice, however many times the doctor gets shot here, and all the other ways he's died isn't enough to split him in half, even though arguably many of these are much, much worse ways to die, but this specific laser, for some unexplained reason, splits the Doctor in two instead of just regenerating normally. WHY WOULD YOU NOT EXPLAIN THIS, YOU TURBO HEAD BRAIN SAUSAGE?! It's pretty obvious that Russell did this so that he could just have a multi-Doctor story with the future incarnation of the Doctor, instead of a past one. Which is an inherently interesting idea that he's played with before. But if you really wanted this conclusion so badly, then I don't see why couldn't he have just had the 15th Doctor arrive in the TARDIS to help out. Given that the Toymaker is such a godlike force, breaking the rules of time wouldn't be too far out of the question. Also, you could still give 14 his happy ending without the bi generation, because you could just have 15 say he'll die once his mind is healed. Even if he just died in battle or died of old age, that's better than literally just having two Doctors exist at all times now because plot. This is the type of writing style that I've criticised Moffat and Chibnall for, for years. And seeing the GOAT write like this is so fucking infuriating and disappointing. Also, also. A fake out regeneration where the Doctor almost regenerates but doesn't actually? Where have I seen that before? I'm regenerating. <sighs> However, despite all of that being built on contrivance and bullshit, I cannot deny that the debut of the 15th Doctor is thoroughly exceptional. Almost immediately, Shooty captures the mannerisms and characteristics of the Doctor with his own spin on them, and he does a fantastic job in the small chunk of this episode that he's in. And at the time of this part of the script being written, the first part of the finale airs tomorrow, and I can safely say he's already cemented himself as one of my favourite Doctors, despite being in a few shit episodes. I'm gonna let it rip! <laughs> Quite literally, shit episodes. And his appearance in this story cemented that from the start, he already had it. But despite the objective best Doctor and one of my favourite sharing screen time together, there's no beating around the bush that the resolution to this story is lame as fuck. It suffers from an issue that a lot of Russell's finales suffer from, particularly his first two, where interesting plot points are dropped in favour of the character drama. Now this 
most of the time, I actually don't mind. For any new viewers here, you should know that for me personally, characters trump all. Because, especially in the case of Doctor Who, good characters can make up for a shit story, bad characters cannot. Most of Tom Baker's era of Doctor Who is pretty shit. It gets very stale and very repetitive very quickly. But then when you have arguably the most iconic and one of the most brilliant Doctors as the lead, you can see why to this day, this is heralded by many as one of the best eras of the show, despite how bad most of it is. It's the same reason why Series 8 is Capaldi's best series, despite also not being very good. But the Doctor himself is great. Show that. What is it? Trust me. What did you give him? Oh, just a spare power set, but I can track the radiation signature. I need to know where they dumped the bodies. I thought you were saving him! He was dead already. I'm saving us. Also, also, why I can enjoy 6's era way more than 5's, because despite neither of them being good doctors, 6 is indefinitely more entertaining. Still bullying children, eh? Villain! Murderer! Hands on your head! The point being, I usually don't mind when Russell will sacrifice an interesting story for the character drama, because that's the stuff that he excels at anyway, and usually the whole series would be building up to that said drama, so it would still have a satisfying feeling of conclusion in the finale, even if story beats were dropped, or resolved in ways that aren't... amazing. However, that doesn't mean I'm not gonna call it out, especially here when it's this overtly piss poor. Like, after spending nearly what would usually be an entire episode's runtime on building up the Toymaker, how do they defeat him? A game of catch. Which despite quite literally being the god of games, he still manages to lose. That's it? Seriously, I don't think you could have thought of a more boring resolution if you tried. And considering the opening plot point to this story went absolutely nowhere and had no bearing on the narrative or plot, it makes you wonder why couldn't we have just cut that out and thought of a more interesting way to defeat the Toymaker? Or if you were going to include this pointless plot point, why not have it play into the resolution somehow? What if the self-indulgence was still active and the Doctor, while playing catch, like, moved down to the ground and started getting random people involved to the point where the Toymaker, like, he can't keep up and he has to forfeit or something? Or maybe because it's been thrown in so many different directions, it catches him off guard and he drops it. Anything over the most horribly edited yet intense game of catch ever put to screen, for God's sake. So there's that story resolved, I guess. But a key part as to why this doesn't work compared to Russell's other finales is that it's built on something that doesn't make sense despite the character drama being great. While series 1 and 2 both have excellent finales filled with excellent drama, it's undeniable that the resolutions to the stories themselves are both kinda mid. Like the series 1 resolution is Rose had absorbed the heart of the TARDIS and she'd spread the words across the universe to remind herself to save the Doctor. Makes sense, was set up in Boomtown, but is a little bit of a letdown, but there is still consequences for this. The series 2 resolution after the Daleks and Cybermen are going to war because they'd been in the void, travelling between the universes, if the Doctor reverses the signal, it would pull them back in. Again, makes sense if a bit underwhelming, but there is also consequences for this. The Series 3 finale is actually the best one by far, because the resolution is set up very early in the series, and only works because of the Master's inherent prejudice against humans that the Doctor is aware of and took advantage of. And he also used the Master's own plan against him, making it a personal triumph as well as it is a blow to the Master's ego. This is a brilliant resolution on its own, but it is also made much better by the fact it has consequences. Seriously, if you can get past these two stupid visuals, the Series 3 finale is easily some of the best this show has to offer. We are changing history. Not just Earth, the entire universe. I'm a Time Lord. I have that right. The Series 4 finale is absolute dog shit, and there's no defending the resolution. For some ungodly reason, 
The Daleks have a control panel that can control every single Dalek, rendering them useless before the Metacrisis blows them up anyway. Absolute nonsense. Garbage. No defending that in the slightest. But at least, it still had consequences. Unlike this resolution, which can be most compared to a resolution in the vein of Series 1 or 2, because it does make sense that you can defeat the Toymaker this way, but it is lame, and there aren't really any consequences for it. While I do actually like what happens to all of the characters from this, you wouldn't be remiss if they all forgot about this in a couple weeks. Because this specific event being part of the catalyst of the Doctor's mental breakdown ultimately leads him to just get a happy ending. Which is good, don't get me wrong. But where's the downside? Oh, your soul was retroactively torn in half. Doesn't seem to bother you that much. At least after all of Russell's finales, even the bad one, all of the characters are different after it. There is consequences, it changes them as people. Rose and Martha both massively grew up, and so did Jack have to because he had to live for hundreds of years. The Ninth Doctor literally died, and Donna had the most tragic fate of all, losing all of the brilliance. But here, everyone just gets a happy ending. Well, that was a load of shit. Can we sue? Out the butt. Yeah, we should sue. <laughs> Where have I seen this before? I mean, that's probably just a reference though, so we can let it slide. Finally back to the episode now, and this is where it picks up again, despite what I just said. So they banish the Toymaker and 15 consoles 14 before we finally get a full reveal of why David Tennant is playing the Doctor again. And that's because, like said to us before, the Doctor hasn't stopped before. The Doctor has been put through so much shit over the years, and his body and mind have told him it's time to stop and settle down for a bit before he has a complete mental collapse. And this is an absolutely marvellous way to naturally integrate the return of David Tennant to the show. Because if you really think about it, the 10th Doctor was the one who suffered and lost the most in his era. And that one thing that was taken away from him repeatedly was the notion of settling down and having a family. Something that this Doctor wanted from the very start. This character arc for the Doctor had started even before he'd regenerated into David Tennant. Who said you're not important? I've travelled to all sorts of places, done things you couldn't even imagine, but you two. Street corner, two in the morning, getting a taxi home. I've never had a life like that. A perfectly sold reason as to why the Doctor got his old face back, so he could finally get what he wanted for all of those years without having to worry about it being taken away from him again. Years of thinking he was better off alone because of how much he loved and lost all of those years ago, being put into fruition now. And honestly, could you think of a better way to unofficially end this first run of New Who than having the old guard, the prefixed version of the Doctor, sign off and hand it off to the new Doctor? And what a better way to represent this as a whole than having the face of Doctor Who as a whole pass the torch to someone else. Also, given that the new Who Doctors have been constantly carrying a burden, for 18 years at this point, taking that weight off the character's shoulders and going back to basics should feel fresh and new. And it has! It's a shame that for some reason in this scene they just reduce Shooty to telling us Doctor Who lore that realistically most people will already know. I think that's more so an issue with this idea of a soft reboot as a whole. I haven't really touched on this in any of them, but if this is meant to be a jumping on point for new viewers then this is like the worst way to get them hooked in. As if it would be easier to get people into Doctor Who saying, oh yeah, watch the 60th anniversary special, the first episode of which is The Star Beast, which is terrible, and it also features the man who everybody universally knows as Doctor Who, and the companion who is universally recognised as the best companion. But you'd then think, oh well this was years ago, why are they here again? Oh, they brought them back so we could continue the story because, um, the ratings sucked. TLDR, I don't think a soft reboot was necessary, but also it doesn't really matter that much. Anyways, back to the point. I don't know why they gave Shooty this line, which is just law. Our whole lifetime, that doctor 
that first met the toy maker never, ever stopped. Put on trial, exiled, key to time, all the devastation of Logopolis, Adric, River Song. Sarah Jane has gone, can you believe that for a second? And Rose, but the Time War, Pandorica, Mavic Chen. We fought the gods of Ragnarok and we didn't stop for a second. Like, damn. I, I kind of already knew all of that, but cool story, bro. Donna also perfectly complements this scene by once again perfectly reinforcing why she was so useful to him by being the one to convince him to stay. Again, the pre-established relationship between these two really helps this story a lot, and that cannot be understated. Especially seeing as they both went through so much different stuff in the 15 years since series 4. We can see that Donna settled down and matured, while the Doctor just kept going. Never stopped. No wonder he's at his wit's end. And in a meta way, I think it does also help that David Tennant has aged appropriately, and given how he's playing the jaded, tired and depressed Doctor in this story, it does really sell how he seems to be trying to cling on to what the Doctor is. But he just can't anymore. When I say aged appropriately, by the way, I mean like, look at Catherine Tate. How does she look almost identical? I mean, obviously it's all down to performance because they've both aged really well because I mean, damn, if I look this good in my 50s, I'll be pleased. You changed your face and then you found me to come home. It's all coming back, I hate you. It's all coming back, you understand? I don't like it. I don't like to think about it. <laughs> Oh. It's, it's... <laughs> also, I know a few people have issue with the TARDIS duplicating, but honestly, I'm not too opposed to it. I think it makes perfect sense that both Doctors get their own prize for winning the game, and that 15's gift has given himself another TARDIS so that 14 can keep his own. It's a nice way to keep the story going and a nice way to end the story of the new Who Doctors. And hey, it's even wheelchair accessible. That's awesome, who's gonna hit on that? That being said, given that one of the biggest problems with this story's resolution is that there's no consequences, don't you think it would have been a lot more impactful had 14 decided to just pass the TARDIS over to 15? Because yes, while the duplication does make sense, you've got to now think there is now two TARDISes in existence. I don't take the TARDIS into battle! Because it's made of wood! Because it's the most powerful ship in the universe and I don't want it falling into the wrong hands! It might be slightly over given that I just had to compare this story to a line in series 7. Definitely wasn't just because I watched it the night before, so it was the first example I could think of or anything. I, I get that this is an anniversary special, so you don't really want to end it on a typically sad Russell T Davies ending. But come on, even the 50th had a better bittersweet ending than this. In the 50th, it's a story that ruined the Time War narrative and is solely responsible for Hell Bent. It's all one title. Gallifrey Falls No More. It's still out there. Where is it indeed? Yes. Lost. Shh. Is that what I'm supposed to do now? Go looking for Gallifrey? Or perhaps it doesn't matter either way. Who knows? Who knows? Wait, why are Shirley and Mel just waiting out here aimlessly? So 15 gets a nice setup, which does leave you very excited for the new era, and I'm not gonna lie, as much as I wasn't a big fan of 15's theme when I first heard it, when it played in the episode, it sounds great. I just pray to God that it doesn't get overplayed and dumbed down to death like 11 and 12's themes. We then end on a very lovely scene of the Doctor finally settled down with the family, and the final interaction between the Doctor and Donna, I won't lie, it brought us to tears. I've never been so happy in my life. As much as anyone can be wrong about the 10th Doctor, it's undeniable that finally seeing him happy after all of this time is just so satisfying. It took nearly 20 goddamn motherfucking years of watching David Tennant as Doctor Who and he finally, after all of this time, and all of that suffering and loss got his happy ending. And it is the most perfect way to end this story imaginable. Twice now, Russell has managed to bring out emotion in me while watching Doctor Who. Something that I haven't felt in a very long time. If only this episode wasn't so half-based, I could have cut the title in half. So, that was the giggle. 
And honestly, that was one of the best stories in years, which is really surprising thing to say, especially after reviewing Wild Boo Yonder. But this story really blew my mind with how well it told this end of the Doctor's character arc and journey. Finally, after all of this time, the Doctor can rest and be happy with his loved ones, told in such a meaningful and poignant way, with his best friend at his side, while softly rebooting the show and bringing us into an exciting new era. Is what I would love to say. But you haven't listened to me tear this bullshit apart for this long for me to start lying to you now. Yeah, while I do actually still quite enjoy this episode, as it undoubtedly has a lot to like, almost everything to like in this story is extremely double-edged or is just straight up built on contrivance and bullshit. Like, literally everything suffers from this. The Toymaker. Absolutely fantastic villain, even though he's very obviously shamelessly lifted from Series 3. He commands your attention with all of the screen time he has. He's perfectly presented with so many creative ideas, leaned to such awesome moments made all the better by Neil Patrick Harris's superb performance. But then he's also used for some whack dialogue that might get no payoff and is defeated in the lamest way imaginable. Mel's back and she's had an insane upgrade from her original run in Doctor Who. But also, it makes no sense as to how she even got here. Being as young as she is also makes a massive plot hole, and she doesn't really add anything to the story, and it's just kind of there for decoration. Like, oh, look, it's Mel! Yeah. I mean, I like Mel now, you made her likeable, but you gonna do anything else with her? Super interesting concept with the toy maker making humanity turn against themselves, which could lead to the end of the world, is only shown with randoms who we don't know for less than two minutes, and Kate for a minute, and then it's just dropped as if it didn't even happen. Donna's pretty good in this episode throughout, but it's undeniable that she feels way less integral to the plot than she did in the last two stories. Basically just being reduced to worrying about the Doctor and reminding us of the past. But she couldn't have really been as integral to this part of the story anyway, because this part of the story is about the Doctor needing to retire and sort himself out. Which is a great story beat. Which unfortunately feels way too sudden because the Star Beast did nothing with it, and it was only set up briefly before this episode dumps it on us, as if it's been built up for ages. Shooty Gatwa's introduction to Doctor Who is awesome, and it's very obvious from this appearance alone that he's going to be a great Doctor. And he is. But he's also introduced through actual nonsense, which is still yet to get an explanation, even though this is being written more than six months after this episode released. Making the giggle, overall, a confusing mess. But it is also still alright. I usually don't like to give out scores in videos because it can make keeping track of every story too much of a hassle, and people will then be like, Oh, you give this episode this? But this episode, this? You can't be trusted. Which is a very disingenuous way to dismiss criticism without actually listening to what's being said. But I think I'd struggle to give this episode anything than a 5 or a 6. Honestly, looking back, maybe even it could be a 4. And the Star Beast could go down to a 3. Because while it is filled to the brim with excellent ideas and moments, almost all of them are eventually bogged down in some way that makes them way less effective than they should be. It's very obvious that this episode needed more time to flesh itself out more, or simply just cut out certain parts of the story. You could also just make it less of a ripoff of your own work. Because overall, while the giggle is somewhat brilliant, it is also a confused mess, with so much missed potential you could write a whole book on it. Thank you all so much for watching. If you managed to make it this far and watched all of my 60th specials reviews, I really appreciate it because you have no idea how much of a struggle I've had getting these videos out. Not only because of copyright, but because of my busy, overly booked, hectic life. I have no time to do YouTube anymore, but I do quite enjoy doing it. I have no idea what is next for the channel, but hopefully I'll see you all again soon. Goodbye. That is complete gibberish. No, I'm not sure about that one. I don't know if that checks out. That's the game of the 21st century.
They shout, and they type, and they cancel. It's pretty obvious that Russell did this just so that he could have a multi-doctor s- Blech. That was shit. So similarly to the s- Oh, fuck. That's lit. <laughs> That's the start of the other fucking video, man. Oh, no. <laughs>